Good morning. Welcome to Highland Park Community Church. We're so grateful to have you on the other side of the monitors today. Things are a little bit different, we know, but we're doing everything we can to serve you in the best ways possible. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor of Celebrate Recovery here at Highland Park, and I can't wait for us to be back together again so that we can hug each other's neck. I had a couple of really cool things happen this week. First of all, I got this card from the men out at the therapeutic community. This is a thank you card for all the things that we have done for them. These men are currently isolated. They can't get out of their, of their facility at all, and they can't have anyone come into the facility. So they're super lonely. A really special card that they sent to us. And the next thing I witnessed this week was right across our parking lot at Elkhorn Rehab Hospital, there was a family standing outside of a window talking to their loved one that was isolated on the inside. It's just such a different time right now. I know there are a lot of people that are suffering from isolation and loneliness right now. So if you would join me in prayer and just, first of all, let's just take a moment and pray for those who are isolated and those who need someone to pray for them. And now if you would, just take a moment and thank God for something that you are grateful for, something that he has provided for you. And now, if you would just take your cares and your worries, lay them at the foot of the cross as we go into our time of worship, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing your son Jesus Christ to the cross for us to take the hit for all of the sins of the world. Heavenly Father, we love you, we trust you, and it is your holy name that we now lift up and praise and worship and glory. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. We'd love for you to sing along with us. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Your grace, God, I need it every day. 
It's the only thing that ever really makes me wanna change. I don't wanna abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me wanna change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet. Numbers chapter 6, God instructs Aaron and Moses to greet the Israelites in this way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Today, as we sing this song, we want to pray that over each one of you and your families. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace the lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace ah. His favor be upon you and a thousand 
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and rejoicing he is for you Welcome once again to Highland Park Community Church. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm the pastor of Celebrate Recovery here. We're so grateful to have you with us today. As we have done through this entire coronavirus pandemic, we are going to continue to follow the recommendations of the state of Wyoming as we move toward opening up the church. So when we get more information, we will pass that on to you. If you go on our website at hpcc.church, you can fill out your prayer request cards connection cards. Show, tell us about your praise reports. We would love to stay connected with you in that way and show us anything that you have that we can do for you in service. We would love to serve you. Also, you can join community groups on that website as well. No one needs to be alone at this time. No one should be alone. We all need each other to lift each other up. Because of the tithes and offerings that you all obediently give to Highland Park and give back to God, we are able at Celebrate Recovery in Highland Park to do a curbside kitchen every Friday between four o'clock and five o'clock. It's been amazing. We have been serving about 50 families. And if anyone is shut in, if you would call us here at the church, we will deliver food as well. As we move into our tithe and offering time, let us just remember that this also is an act of worship. You can give online. You can also do it the old fashioned way with putting a stamp on the envelope. And we would gladly accept that from you and put it to work for good uses for the kingdom of God. But if you are one of those people that many people, especially these last two weeks, have lost their jobs, we're not putting any pressure on you whatsoever. We understand that this is a difficult time. So do not feel like you need to if you can't at this time. But let us know how we can serve you. Would you all please join me in prayer? Oh, Father God, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, Lord. 
especially your son, Jesus Christ. Father, may he be the one that is lifted up here through this service. Heavenly Father, we would just like you to be with the people that are on the front lines of this pandemic, the doctors, the nurses, the people that are cleaning our hospitals, and even the scientists that are trying to find a solution, a vaccine for this deadly disease. Heavenly Father, we entrust all of them to you. May their, your strength be their strength. And Father, as we have given of our tithes and offerings, may you multiply those in a mighty, mighty way so that it would bring more people into your kingdom. This is a time when people are seeking you. And Father, let us have the courage to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is in the blessed name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, happy Sunday, and thank you so much for inviting us into your living room today. And I am so excited to be able to share and talk about Jesus and grow in our relationship with Jesus together today. I want to start by just checking in with you, and even though I'm not in your living room, we can have a conversation. How was your week? As you're thinking, let me tell you a little bit about mine. I had some good days this week, and I had a couple hard days this week. Now, I'm not asking for sympathy. I just wanted to talk about it for a minute. My guess is, since, you've, since we're all in this COVID-19 thing together, you've probably had some good days. And maybe your good days have been, like there have been more good days than tough days. But for those of us who have tough days, this past week, I had melancholy day. And for whatever reason, that melancholy just really set in. It's just kind of a blue kind of day. And what I want to share about that is just simply this is that what God has shown me is on my best days, he's there with me, and I thank God for those good days. And on those days that are melancholy, the ones that I wish would get over, the ones that I want to get through, the ones that, that just feel blue and, and I just wish that they were done, I don't want to rush through those because days like that remind me that I need Jesus. And what he shows me is that he's faithful. You guys, when days are good, more often than not, we think, well, I don't really need God today. I've got everything under control. The truth is, we need God on our good days, and we need him on our bad days. And so if you've had good days this week, man, thank God. And if you've had hard days this week, thank God, because it's been an opportunity for you to be able to connect with him. Hey, I wanted to start by telling you a cool story. As we know, there's been good days, there's been hard days. Over the past several weeks, life here in Wyoming has been very uncertain. I've heard stories about people losing their jobs. I've heard people furloughed from their jobs. I've heard stories about people who have taken pay cuts or hourly cuts uh, just to be able to, to keep the business afloat and to be able to keep their job. Well, in the midst of all this uncertainty, everybody's received a stimulus check. And this past week, our phone at the church started ringing with some individuals who have said, hey, God's blessed me, and I'm feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit that he wants me to help people in need, and so I want to give my check to some people who could use it more than me. How cool is that? What I celebrate in that story is, is, is their willingness to help. That's the church. The church is always looking for opportunities to take what they have, give it to God, and ask God to use it in ways that would bring glory and honor to his name. The thing that I celebrate about this story is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit whispered into these individuals' lives and said, hey, would you consider doing this for somebody else? And they knew what that voice sounded like, and they said, I'm all in. Let me ask you, what does the voice of the Holy Spirit sound like? Let me help. It sounds like love. And I know that God may not ask you or the Holy Spirit may not whisper and ask you to give your stimulus check. That's okay because you might need that. It's awesome. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't going to ask you to love this week, isn't going to ask you to reach out this week. He's going to ask you to love people. And what I, want, what I want to tell you is when he invites you to do that, Take this same step of boldness because that simple act of love can go a long, long way. 
In fact, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do right now. What I'm gonna ask you to do right now is to fill up the Facebook feed, fill up the feed on YouTube of ways that you've seen God work this week. Right now, we're gonna take a quick pause, fill up the Facebook feed. How have you seen God work? And if he's asked you to do something this week, just fill it up. Our pastors are actually on, uh, on Facebook and, and we wanna interact with you. So please go ahead and do that right now. Very cool. Well, hey, as you're doing that, what I wanna let you know is that as a church, we continue to pray for you. We continue to pray for those affected directly and indirectly by COVID-19. And also, we are, when we pray, when I say that we're praying, what we're praying is that, you, that everybody would experience the fullness of the faithfulness of God in their lives. And that's what we're praying. So that being said, we are going to jump into our second week of our series, Hurt by the Church. If you missed last week, I would encourage you to go back and check it out. It was a great kickoff to the series, and there's a lot that you should that you should go back if you missed and, and just kind of recap because there's some great information there that's going to help Jesus heal some of the hurts in your life. One of the things that I shared last week was simply this. I shared how much I love the church. I love the church. I shared how the church is not a building. It's a group of people. And the older I've gotten the more I realize that people get hurt by the church. And that breaks my heart, breaks God's heart. But have you ever thought about how God made you uniquely you? He made you uniquely you. He made me uniquely me. There are so many different personality types, and we all come to relationships with our own backstory. Like we all have our individual upbringings that had events, some of them tragic, some of them horrific. All to say we come to relationships with stuff. We come to it with our generational differences. We come to relationships with our generational values. They're not bad, they're just different. We come to relationships with cultural differences and cultural values. And then you throw in like the worship of God together and like sometimes we can get sideways over our music, sometimes we can get sideways over communication styles. And man, with that many differences, people are gonna get hurt by the church. And so the Holy Spirit just whispered into my life one day after a lunch with some friends, hey, let's talk about this and let's help people find some healing in Jesus' name. And that's what we're hoping, that's what we're praying happens in your life today. You guys, we're gonna acknowledge our hurts, but we're not gonna fixate on our church. Or we're not gonna fixate on our hurts is what I'm gonna say. We're not going to fixate on our hurts, we're going to acknowledge our hurts. And most of all, what we want everybody to experience is healing in Jesus' name. When I say healing in Jesus' name, I've got some specific markers in my mind as far as that goes. The first marker is this. When we say that we want people healed in Jesus' name, we're literally praying that Jesus Christ would heal your hurts, that the place that you've been hurt by the church, Jesus would literally heal those hurts. The second thing we're praying for is we know that when people are hurt by the church, they leave the church, and sometimes they leave Jesus. We're praying that for those that have been hurt by the church and have walked away from Jesus, that would reconnect with him. Jesus has never stopped running after. He's never abandoned you, and he wants to re-engage with you today. That would be a healing step in your life to reconnect with Jesus. And the third thing that we're praying for is this, is that those who have been hurt by the church and have been walked away, or and have walked away, what we're praying is that you would take a bold step and that you would reconnect with the church, a Christ-centered church, a loving church. There are no perfect churches out there. Find a church where you can love Jesus, where you can be accepted as who you are, and then re-engage. Become active in the church. And here's what's gonna happen. Jesus will heal your hurts, and he will use, use the hurts of the past to help other people heal. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did something radical. He didn't have to, but he chose to. He chose to build a church with broken people like me and like you, with different personalities, with different backgrounds, 
with different likes, and he put us all together. And he says, now, what I want you to do is I want you to go into all the world, and I want you to share my love with the people. And how you do this is going to either reflect on me positively or negatively. And don't worry, he says, because it's going to be bumpy sometimes. There's just differences. But here's what I want you to know about the church is even though it's not perfect, it's Jesus' love who binds us all together. And every time we stub toes in one another's life, it's a chance to show the world what love looks like, what reconciliation looks like, what forgiveness looks like. The church is not a place that throws away relationships. So if you, if you missed last week, uh, our theme verse for this series is Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. It's a prophecy about Jesus about 800 years before Christ, Christ comes. The prophet Isaiah, God prompts him to prophesy about Jesus. And in this passage is just some wisdom for us as far as healing, being healed from our hurts. And Isaiah says that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And check this out. By his wounds, we are healed. Now, there's a big mouthful here. This is in regards to the crucifixion, which is going to set us free. But what this verse is saying is that there's a lot of sin in our lives, and that sin is responsible for our hurts. But at the end of this verse is a giant exclamation point. We are healed by his wounds. If you've been hurt by somebody, if you've been hurt by the church, it is by Jesus we can be healed. Now I want to show you verse 6 because it's really important. Verse 6 says this, We all like sheep have gone astray. I want to focus on all and astray. We've all gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. That's the origin of hurt. When we only think about ourselves, when we only care about ourselves, when we are only concerned with what we want, that's most of the time how hurts happen and that's how they happen inside of the church. Thank God that we don't have to be hurt by the church and stay there. We can be healed by his stripes. Let me ask you, if you knew there was something that you could do today that would help you get over your hurt, would you do it? If you knew there was something that you could do today that would take the place where you hurt the most, and replace those feelings of hurt with love, would you want to know how? Because that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about that. And I want to pick up where we left off last week with prayer. I asked you last week to simply talk with God and tell him about the hurt that exists in your life. Tell him how it happened. Tell him where it happened. Tell him where it hurts. We started off with prayer, and we're going to continue there. Prayer was a big deal back in the day. When I say back in the day, I'm talking about ancient times for the Jewish people. Three times a day, somebody would, would grab a shofar, think about a long ram's horn, and they would blow through it, and it would make this massive noise. And this massive noise coming through the ram's horn would echo throughout the country, and it would echo miles down the road, and people, when they heard it, knew exactly what was supposed to happen. They would drop everything that they were doing, and they would start to pray. For Jesus and his disciples, this was a part of their daily life. No matter what was going on, when they heard the ram's horn, they would stop what they were doing, and they would seek God. Well, as the disciples walked with Jesus, what they noticed is, is that there was a difference between Jesus' prayers and their prayers. And what they noticed is there was a difference between the relationship that God and Jesus had and there was a, a difference between their relationship and the relationship that they had with God. So they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, will you teach us to pray? And Jesus says, yeah. Now we're most familiar with it. No, it's known as the Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer is how we commune with God and Jesus shares us how to do that. And we're going to look at it. But here's what I want to tell you. 
tucked inside of the Lord's prayer, tucked inside of the Lord's prayer is insight on how we can be healed from our hurts. Tucked inside of the Lord's prayer, Jesus put something in there that is going to help us heal from our hurts. And I want to share that with you today. So that being said, Jesus starts out the prayer and he says, all right, when you pray, pray our father who art in heaven. Quickly, your name, God, is above all other names. It is, wor- it is the only name worthy to be praised. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom is a kingdom of love. It is a kingdom of peace. And it has come in the form of Jesus Christ. And we are praying that Jesus, that love and peace would come to all people. And that God's will would be done. What's his will? If you ever want to know what he wants us to do, it is to love people. Then Jesus says, hey, pray this. Give us today our daily bread. We all need something. We all need God's help with something. So ask him. And now here it is. Here's the insight. Forgive us our debts and help us forgive our debtors. Everything that Jesus says in this prayer is life-giving. But this line that he says right here is insight on how he heals us from our hurts. He says, forgive. Forgiveness heals our hurts. Specifically, the forgiveness of God. The forgiveness of God through his son, Jesus Christ, forgives our sins and it heals our hurts. I want to go back, and if we can just put up on the screen, forgive us our debts. I want to look at that line. Forgive who? Forgive us our debts. I know that most of us in here, uh, most of us here today are familiar with debts. A debt is simply an outstanding balance. And as Americans, we are very familiar with having debt. We are very familiar with an outstanding balance. After all, we have a national debt. It's not a political statement. It's just a fact. We have a national debt. But many Americans have debt on top of that. The average consumer debt in America is $5,000 per household related to credit cards. For those of us with cars, and if we have car payments, the average car payment, the debt associated with that, on a monthly basis is $500 a month. I think about, I think about those of you who are in college right now. Many of you are going to graduate college with tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars of debt. Many of you are entering the workforce with tens of thousands of dollars of debt. And then you're going to go out and you're going to get a house and you're going to get a mortgage. And we know what that mortgage is. That mortgage, it's more debt. Debt is an outstanding balance. Well, Jesus says, forgive us our debts. And that there's something healing about that. Could you imagine if the bank called you up one day and said, hey, so-and-so, I was thinking about you this week, and I I recognize and I noticed that, hey, we still have a mortgage, we still have a car payment, or we still have some student loans. Could you imagine if the bank said during the course of that phone call, hey, the reason I'm calling today is because I want to let you know that the bank has chosen to forgive your debts. The bank has chosen to actually pay your debt for you. Could you imagine? You would be like, no way. You would be like, can you say that again? Hey, is this a joke? Who is this again? You'd be asking all these questions, trying to to temper the excitement. But once you realized it was real, you would go absolutely crazy. You would go and you would... You would get on your social media feeds, you'd get on Instagram, you would get on your uh, Facebook page, you would be tweeting people, you would be texting people, you would let everybody know about how the bank forgave your debt. Well, I want to go back to this for a minute because this forgive our debt thing is a really big deal that Jesus asks us to pray, and he's not talking about money. Forgive us our debts is telling us that we have an outstanding debt with God. And that debt is in relation to something known as sin. Now, for most people, not all people, but for most people, you're familiar with Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden, walking with God, and they sinned. But what we fail to really uh, pay attention to is to really understand the depth and the ugliness of that sin. 
You see, the depth and that ugliness of sin created a debt for humanity with God. God gave Adam and Eve an entire garden to just do life with him in. I'm not talking about a 10-acre garden. I'm talking about a massive garden. And his instructions for life were simply this. Enjoy everything. Just don't eat the fruit of this one tree. Jesus, or God, held nothing back from Adam and Eve except one tree. He's like, everything else is for you to enjoy. But they had to have that too. And when they decided to disobey God, that's sin. Because they were going against God's recommendation on living. And sin entered the world. And God said, hey, this breaks my heart. There's a debt that has to be paid. The two debts are separation from God and death. And you might think to yourself, that sounds really, really steep. You're right, but we need to understand who God is. God is love, absolutely. But God is holy. He is set apart. He is pure. He is blameless. And we went against what his instructions for life were. And we've inherited all of that from Adam and Eve. It exists in my life. It exists in your life. Maybe you can see it. Maybe it's in the form of a, what do we call them? A white lie. Maybe it's in the thought of an angry, angry emotion or anger, th angry thought towards somebody. Like me, like you. You've probably gotten mad at somebody. You really you wanted to hurt them. You wanted to say something mean. You wanted to hurt their emotions. Jesus calls that murdering in our hearts. You guys, there's sin, and that sin created a debt. Well, did you know what Jesus said? He says, forgive us our debts. He's promising us that God is faithful. He will forgive us. And it's better than what a bank could do for us. Because check this out, God, in his goodness, allowed his son, Jesus Christ, to be the payment for death and separation from him. Jesus Christ, son of God, clothed himself in flesh, made his dwelling among us, and he went to the cross and he died for you and me so that that death could be paid, so that we wouldn't have to pay it. And in that separation, Jesus becomes our bridge back to God, back to his love, the way that he intended all along. You see, this deal, forgive us our debts, is a really big deal because God has forgiven us our debts. You can't get this kind of forgiveness anywhere else in the world we all have this debt with God, and Jesus sets us free from that. He has removed, he being God, has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. That's an interesting thing to say. You know, for most of us, we know the distance, or we know that there's a north pole and a south pole, and you can actually calculate the distance between them. It's actually 12,440 miles. That's the difference between the North Pole and the South Pole, 12,440 miles. Well, we did some math this week, and we found out that the distance between New York and L.A. is 2,700 miles. That's the width of our country. What you would have to do to get to 12,440 miles is you could stack America on its side four and a half times, and that would take up the space of 12,440 miles. But Jesus didn't say he's removed our sins as far as the north is from the south. He said he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. You guys, there are no poles. The east-west line is a continuum. It just goes on infinitely. And forgive us our debts is the healing work of Jesus Christ that infinitely removes our sin from us. It is like our records have been expunged. Jesus has pardoned us from our sins, and we are given a brand new start in Jesus. You see, I told you that forgive us our sins is healing. It is God through his son Jesus forgiving our sins and healing us. 
But that's just the first part of the verse. You see, there's more healing to be done. Jesus says, when you pray, pray, God, forgive us our debts and help us forgive our debtors. Last week, I told you that I was going to ask you to do something really big and that this big thing was going to help you to heal from your hurts. But what I want to let you know is I'm not the one asking. Today, Jesus is asking you. He's asking you to forgive the person who has sinned against you. Today, Jesus Christ is asking you to forgive the person who hurt you, the person at the church. He's asking you to forgive the church. Jesus always has our best interest in mind. And I know right now that there are some who are thinking, I don't know that I can do that. And what I want to tell you is Jesus is going to give you his strength. He's giving you his spirit and he's giving you his willingness that will help you forgive the church. You said earlier on that you want to get better. You don't want to be bitter. You want to get better. You said, I want Jesus to heal my hurts. His plan for your healing goes through the waters of forgiveness. And he's going to ask you to walk through the hurt and forgive the church that hurt you. Forgive the person who hurt you. Now, I know today that there's probably somebody saying, no way, you're hurting too bad. In fact, you might even be so bold as to say, I want them to hurt the way that I hurt. I get it. Hurt does crazy stuff to us. But if we were really to get honest, you want to be able to experience healing. And you want God's best for them. I know you do. And Jesus wants God's best for them. What I want to do is I want to read an encounter that Jesus had. Turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 7. Jesus is going to show us, he's going to help us forgive our debtors. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Here we go. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus over for a meal. Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down at the dinner table. Just then, a woman of the village, who was a town harlot, that tells us an awful lot about the character of this lady and the activities that she engages in. This woman, having learned that Jesus was a guest at the home of the religious leader, a Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet weeping, raining tears on Jesus' feet. She let down her hair, which in culturally speaking was a huge no-no. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man was a prophet like I thought he was, he would not, or he would have known the kind of woman who is falling all over him right now. Jesus, knowing what's going on in Simon's mind, says, Simon, there's something I'd like to tell you. And Simon replies, okay, tell me. He says, Jesus says to Simon, there were two men in a debt, in debt to a banker. One owed five hundred uh, silver pieces, the other 50. Neither of them could pay up, and so the banker canceled both debts. Which of the two would be more grateful? Simon thought, and he answered, I suppose the one who has been forgiven the most. That's right, said Jesus. Then turning to the woman, speaking to Simon, he said, do you see this woman? I came to your home, and you provided no water for my feet but she rained tears on my feet and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting, but from the time I've arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for freshening up, and yet she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She has been forgiven many, many sins. Not because of the action that she took. She just understood who she is. She's the town harlot. She understands all the activities, and she understands that Jesus loves her, that God has forgiven her debt, and because she understands how much she's been forgiven, she's moved to tears, she has moved to action. It is an emotional deal, understanding. She's like, God, how can I ever repay you? Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Uh, that set the dinner guest talking behind his back. Who does he think he is, Jesus, forgiving sins? Jesus ignored him, said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Well, there's a line I want to focus on that Jesus said. He said that those who have been forgiven much love much. And those who feel that they've been forgiven a little, well, they only love a little. 
You guys, if we're going to heal from our hurt, this is really important for us to understand, is that our willingness to forgive others is directly proportionate to our understanding of our own forgiveness. Meaning, our ability and our willingness to forgive others is directly proportionate to our understanding of how much Jesus has forgiven us, how much God has forgiven us. The woman in the story gets how much she's been forgiven, and that's why she responds the way she does. But the man in the story, the religious leader in the story, responds the way he does for a very specific reason. Because he's a religious leader. He's the guy that goes to church. He's the guy that doesn't miss prayer. He's a good guy who makes a few mistakes. And when he looks at his life, he's like, there's just not a whole lot to forgive here. And that's what he thinks. But he fails to see that he has been forgiven much. And those who have been forgiven much love much. And those who feel forgiven little love little. Let me ask you a question. Who would best demonstrate you? The woman who understands she's been forgiven much or the man who thinks, well, I'm pretty much a good guy, not a whole lot to forgive. You see, our ability and our willingness to forgive others is directly proportionate to our understanding of how much we've been forgiven. If we don't think we've been forgiven much, we're probably not going to forgive much. But if we understand how much we've been forgiven, then we're probably going to be very willing and able because Jesus is going to help us to forgive those who have hurt us. And I want to tell you that your ability, your ability to heal is directly tied to your willingness to forgive. Jesus today wants to help you forgive. He wants to help you, remind you how much you've been forgiven so that you, he can help you forgive those who have hurt you. I wanted to close with one more story today. It's probably one of the most amazing stories. It's a generational story of forgiveness. It's a story of Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom was a woman living in Holland. She was a Dutch woman during the time of Nazi Germany's rise. She and her family saw the, the egregious acts of Germany against the Jewish people and took up the Jewish people's plight. She hid them, she loved them, she cared for them. Well, word got back to Germany, and Germany came and they arrested her, Corey and her family. And they treated her as a war criminal, and they, put, they threw her in a concentration camp and treated her like all the other prisoners. You can only imagine the verbal abuse, the emotional abuse, the physical abuse that she endured. Well, years, she survived, she survived the war, but her sister didn't. After the war, she was invited to share her story, and she went around talking about the events that occurred, but she had a specific message in that. It was a message of forgiveness. And on this particular night, what she didn't know is she spoke of God's love, is she spoke of her Messiah's forgiveness of her sins, and that he had removed her sins, and that we're to forgive others. In the audience that night was a prison guard from the camp that she was at. What she would do after every speaking engagement is there would be a receiving line. People could come and say, hey, thanks for sharing. Hey, it's great to meet you. Hey, just wanted to say thank you. And that night as Corey looked up, she saw a face that she hadn't seen since the war ended. It was the prison guard. And he was in the receiving line making his way towards her. We can't, we can't even begin to imagine the emotions that she felt. We can't imagine the thoughts that were com coming across her mind because every time somebody shook her hand or hugged her and moved on, that guard got closer. But we don't have to wonder because she tells us what she said. In her, in her monologue, she was like, I hate that man. That man hurt me. That man is part of, partly responsible for killing my sister. He's the enemy. Lord, I need you. That's what's going on in her mind until the man stands before her. And I want to read their exchange that they had together. I want to read it and share it with you. Now the man is in front of me with his hand thrust out. He says to me, Corey, how good it is to know that as you say, all sins are at the bottom of the sea. You mentioned that you were at the camp in Ravensbrook. I was a guard there. 
But since that time, I have gone on to become a follower of Jesus. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips. And then he asks her, Corey, will you forgive me? Silently, she prayed, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. Lord, I can lift my hand, but you've got to give me the strength to lift my hand. And so as mechanically and as woodenly and not very, very uh, excited, I put my hand into the one that was stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current that started in my shoulder that gave me the strength to shake his hand raced down my arm and sprang into our hands. And healing took place in my heart and my whole mind as my eyes began to well up with tears. She hugged the man who had beat her physically, emotionally, and verbally for being a part of her egregious acts at the prison camp. And she cried out, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard, the former prisoner. She says she had never known God's love so intensely as she did in that moment. I know that we probably all have different hurts, but probably not hurts like that. And yet Jesus gave her the strength to forgive. And today, again, he is asking you to forgive the church, the person who has hurt you at the church. And what Corey found was that when she forgave that man, God gave her the strength and she found healing. There will be healing for you if you will forgive the person who hurt you. And you will find that Jesus sets you free as well, free from the hurt and the pain, and he'll replace that with love. Today, I'm going to give you three radical, bold steps that you can take where Jesus will meet you and he will help you forgive your debtor. The first one is in regards to the Lord's Prayer. I want you to lean into it. Pray daily. Lord, forgive me my debts and help us forgive our debtors. And in that, Jesus is asking us to forgive. And he'll heal us if we'll forgive our debtors and if we'll ask him for forgiveness. He will forgive our sins. He will heal our hurts. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going, to ask you, I'm going to ask you to practice saying, I forgive you. Whoever it is that hurt you, I'm asking you to practice saying their name followed by, I forgive you. So whatever their name is, so-and-so, I forgive you. I want you to practice saying that in preparation for actually forgiving them. And the third thing that I'd ask you to do is quit, stop, is quit talking about the hurt. Quit talking about the hurt. Start talking about the healing. Every time that you want to talk about the hurt, start with, Jesus healed me. He forgave me my sins and healed my hurt. And he has helped me forgiven the person who hurt me. This week in your community groups, I'm going to ask all of us to be able to just kind of sit and live here, marinate on this a little bit. And I'm going to ask every group this week to read Luke chapter 7, 36 through 48. And as you read that, there are some questions that I would love for you to answer. The questions are simply this. Do you believe you've been forgiven much or little? Explain. Who do you best relate to in the story? Would you describe your attitude towards God as love much or love little? Have you been hurt by the church? Are you going to forgive or are you going to hold on to? Here's just some questions that you guys can kick around as you talk about how Christ has forgiven you, forgiven us of our sins and healed our hurts. And now it's time for you to forgive the church, the person has hurt you. And in doing so, the Spirit of God will heal your heart and heal your mind and set you free. Lord God, I want to say thanks for my brothers and sisters. Today we have talked about a heavy, heavy deal, and I know that Satan would love nothing more than to hold us and keep us captive. So I pray in the mighty power of Jesus' name 
pray in our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, that today people would find healing from their hurts in Jesus' name, that the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead would visit people in their homes and in their hearts and their minds and set them free. To God be glory in the church forever and ever. It's the hardest thing to give away and the last thing on your mind today. It always goes to those who don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they cause is just too real. It takes everything you have to say the word forgiveness. Forgiveness. It flies in the face of all your pride, it moves away. jury and the judge they say you got a right to hold a grudge it's the whisper in your ear saying set it free forgiveness, forgiveness. It can even set a prisoner free. There is no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really frees is you. Forgiveness. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Forgiveness. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Lord willing, we'll see you guys next week.